everyone, and welcome to the Sanya Faruqi Show. I am thrilled to introduce you to our new series called Women for Press Freedom. And today is the first episode, and joining us is Elena Pasquini. She's a foreign affairs journalist specialized in international relations, development, and humanitarian interventions. She's also a contributor to various Italian and international news outlets and has extensively covered the European Union and the United Nations from Rome and around the world. Earlier this year, she was amongst the few journalists reporting from the Democratic Republic of Congo. I am absolutely thrilled and honored to have you on the Sanya Faruqi show, Elena. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sanya. I'm really glad to be here with you today. So thank you very much. What kind of challenges did you face while you were reporting from DRC? Tell us a little about the kind of stories you worked on and the people you were interviewing. And how safe was it for you to be on the ground? Did you get support from local journalists or, you know, just um, take us through your experience of being on the ground in DRC? Um, well, of course, it's a very complex environment in terms of uh, um, challenges, uh, for safety and security uh, reason. But for me, the main challenge uh, in a conflict environment, such as the one in DRC, is uh, to navigate the complexity of the area. Uh, the risk of reporting from a conflict zone is not just a physical, it's just not just a question of safety. Uh, uh, the journalist is a big responsibility in the word we use, the words we use, the way in which we cover. Um, it's it's really a complex uh, conflict, uh, deeply rooted in the past of the DRC uh, with the multiple actors involved. And as a journalist, um, I think we have the duty of admitting this complexity, uh, be aware of the um, difficulty in understanding and uh, uh, be careful in even in the word the single words we use to portray this conflict uh, we are in an interconnected world so if i publish anything in italy even if it's in italian or in french this story uh, will be um, will go around in every country and in drc as well i was uh, in uh, in italy and uh, I had a conversation with uh, with the person in uh, in Bunia, and uh, he um, he told me, "Yes, you you don't understand that sometimes you write, and what you write has the power of uh, uh, spark debate, uh, ignite hate, uh, um, and uh, um, even have impact in the conflict itself. Uh, not, of course, as the actors." in the country, but uh, as a foreign journalist, we have the duty of try to uh, to be aware that we can just touch the surface and we can make mistake. And it's very hard to verify information, just uh, also because of the logistic, you need to have multiple sources. So it's really the complexity of the environment. Uh, you can deal with uh, security issue. Of course, this conflict is very dangerous. But it's the understanding of the area, which is really, is re it was really hard for me. Yeah, the um, I mean the annual reporters without borders ranking for 2020 put DRC at 150th position out of 180 states. Can you, from your experience and what you saw on the ground, tell us why safety remains unfortunate with little or no effort to guarantee impunity for the crimes against journalists in DRC? Uh, well, uh, the um, being a journalist in, in DRC, it's really hard. It's really a challenge. The journalists face a multiple risk um, due to the conflict itself. It's very dangerous uh, to travel around, to go in the, in the places where fact happens, uh, to verify information. Uh, they face multiple threats from armed groups, uh, uh, from uh, um, even institutional uh, threats in terms of uh, um, uh, defamation uh, and so on and so forth. Uh, well, uh, the lack of a legislation in place that really protect the freedom of the press is the main challenge. But the impunity, impunity is um, 
it's the problem of that area. It's a big problem of that area. We have crimes committed 30 years ago, uh, which is still need to be uh, understood. Uh, there are no um, responsible punished for that crime. So, so impunity is a, a very big issue in the area for all the different crimes for the human rights abuses which are reported um, from fighters, from militias. Another um, uh, very big issue for journalists is that this is not a conventional um, conflict. Uh, so, um, what do you, you mean? Have oh, sorry, what do you mean it's not a conventional Well, it's not. It's not you don't have two armies fighting each other. You have fighters who do not wear a uniform. They they live within the communities, so it's very hard to to know, to verify sources, to know who is in front of you. You are talking with who, and uh, so those, in my opinion, of course, um, make this uh, this this um, uh, reporting from that area very very complex. Harm uh, groups uh, poses a very big challenge just. Uh, to cover the entire the east of DRC, which is the area uh, where I, I from where I reported, and of course I don't understand, don't know what's happening in other areas of the countries. But of course, a lack of legislation, it's uh, it's a big uh, big issue. What were the kind of challenges that um, you know you faced while you were there? Tell us a little about the kind of stories you worked on and the people you were interviewing. How safe was it for you? Um, you know, which were the who were the networks that you were depending on, and um, you know, so, like who helped you on the ground? How did you connect with other journalists? A little about that. I um, travel in Ituria in North Kivu, and. Uh, um, I cover different kind of stories. In Ituri, um, I was based in Bunia, and it was very hard to travel around the city. The uh, security situations was really hard at that moment. Um, and uh, many uh, international organizations, NGOs, do not travel uh, along those roads. And how was that to cover the displacement of uh, people uh, people displaced in that area and uh, the conflict in the villages? Uh, and uh, I met a different um, um, uh, civil society uh, organization members, uh, um, different members of the different communities uh, that, uh, that are in, uh, in Nituri. Uh, and uh, in Goma, I uh, reported from the neighborhood of the city where there are very complex uh, situations and you know, kidnapping every day. The level of violence is very high. And then I travel along uh, um, some of the routes around Goma to um, cover agriculture in conflict zone. Uh, well, I face a, well, the risk, uh, basically the same risk that uh, Congolese people face, but of course with different, uh, different level of risk and different problems. Uh, the kidnapping, kidnapping is very common in that area. Uh, so you have to put in place some safety um, safety rules uh, to try to protect yourself and the stuff to travel with you. Um, and um, one of the big issues are the checkpoints uh, along the roads, uh, which can be checkpoints from the army, checkpoints from armed groups, different actors, which is not easy. It's not always easy to understand who they are exactly. Uh, they often ask for money. Um, and, uh, uh, well, the most important thing is to know, uh, to have uh, contacts on the ground and to rely on a network of journalists who previously traveled and know that area. This kind of uh, reporting is, for me, simply impossible if you don't have other journalists who traveled in those areas before and you can have conversation about the situation and the journalists who are uh, more experts than you. Uh, they usually offer advice, put in contact with a journalist on the ground, with the fixers and producers who are really the person you, you put your life in their hand. 
Um, you were based out of DSC around the time when the Italian ambassador was killed in February along with two other people in the attack in the east of DRC. And you've also interviewed him. So tell us a little about what happened and also about your conversation with him before he was killed. Yes, I, I was in Goma um, a few days before the attack to the convoy. Um, where the ambassador and uh, the other uh, member of the Italian embassy and the WFP was traveled. Uh, I was in Kinshasa when he was killed. Uh, they were killed. And um, I travel along the same route with the same convoy just a few days before in that area. That's a road that leads from um, uh, Goma to um, Uganda. It's a very um, there are a lot of uh, there's a lot of traffic in that area because because it's a, it's a as I said the road that connect uh, Goma, which is the capital of the North Kivu, to the Uganda, and uh, it's a really it's a very dangerous zone. It's dangerous um, as is dangerous any conflict of any war zone in a conflict area. Of course, in a conflict, there are areas which are more dangerous than other less dangerous the level of risk differs from area to area to another uh, that area um usually along that road ngos and organization travel without the escort so he was uh, um the, the convoy was attacked and um it's very hard for me uh, to have an idea what's really happened uh, for the experience that I have in that that I had in that area um, I can say that kidnapping for the purpose of getting a ransom are very very common in that area which is quite close to the city of Goma kidnapping happens even within the city within the city center so it's uh, uh, it's and very common by who? There are hundreds, Sorry, who? more than hundreds who are the people behind this kidnapping? Do we have a sense of that? Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, for me. Uh, it will be very, very hard to find who was behind that uh, attacks because there are hundred and more than hundred and twenty armored groups operating just in North Kivu. Uh, many of them do not have a, a, an agenda or a specific. Uh, a clear reason some of them they had you can recognize who they are who they are not but some are even just gangs um that uh, they they are looking for money and so kidnap for just for this reason that um profit of the chaos of the situation so it's very hard to um, to to say who's behind uh, i hope that the investigation would lead to a uh, um well will discover who's behind the attack to the ambassador but it it's very hard and the impunity as i said before is common uh every 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 year every day this kind of crimes are committed and it's very rare that someone uh, is uh, convicted for those crimes or identified even just identified so it's uh, um it's uh, unfortunately a very very complex situation i do not have any um specific idea of uh, who can be and uh, and yes it's really it's really hard to to understand what are the organization uh, in the, in the area that can be the, yeah there are many many different uh, potential actors i mean so it's uh, it's very complex yeah as you mentioned, one of the biggest challenges in DRC is learning how to navigate through the armed groups and the military presence that operates all over the country, including the borders and checkpoints. Um, you know, you spoke you uh, in our pre-interview, you mentioned what happens at checkpoints. So tell us a little about how that ecosystem works and why does it make it even more challenging for journalists to navigate that space? Uh, yes. Um Along the main roads, uh, there are, of course, checkpoints. It's quite common uh, from the, the army, but also from the armed groups. And uh, is a way of, uh, of making money because they ask for money. And uh, for journalists, of course, that's a challenge. Uh, you need to uh, rely on, on the stuff you have on the ground. They know the situations, they are aware about 
who uh, who are uh, who the people you are meeting are, um, and how to you have to uh, change your behavior, talk with them or not to talk. Usually, you don't talk to anyone. It's just a local journalist that talk with the people you meet. But um, yes, I've been uh, I've been for instance in Ituri, and uh, I was in the city center, and it was a big protest. Uh, because at a checkpoint was a, 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 a killing of a, of a person in uh, during my stay there and the, the people the, the population of the city start to protest because of this this killing because usually if you don't pay the risk is uh, that the the armed groups or the uh, the people that create this uh, this checkpoint can uh, can kill you uh, that also means that the Mm, it's very easy to to travel if you pay in a way. So for illicit flows of, for instance, minerals or for um, I know a Kalashnikov or other uh, yeah illicit traffic, it's uh, it can be uh, probably not so difficult to go through these checkpoints uh, if you pay at these checkpoints. And what happens but, if you can't pay, if you don't have the money, if you can't afford to pay every time you go out reporting? Yeah, it's uh, you You need to have money, cash, a lot of cash. That's <laughs> uh, you have to. I didn't have a lot, a lot of problem. I was in that situation. So, uh, and it's very hard for a foreign journalist to understand exactly what are the risks on the ground. What's really important is to travel with a journalist who know very well the area, yeah. who is uh, able to prevent the problem. So you should not arrive at the point in which you are blocked at a checkpoint. It's hard, but you should be aware of what is happening on the road before arriving there so i my um my colleague uh, kilimali was absolutely great and uh, we had an incredible uh, reporting on the ground yes uh, you know there are a lot of talks and efforts by rsf and jd that's journalist in danger in drc They've been pursuing, pushing the DRC government to prioritize major reforms in order to keep its promise to improve press freedom in the country, also to step up protection for journalists, combat impunity. Do you think such changes will be brought in? And what, do you, what is the role of corruption in the country and what can be done, rather what needs to be done to improve the state of press freedom? Uh, well, that's a very, very tough question because the um, um, the, the situations on the ground is it's really, really complex. Um, I think that uh, we need to keep the spot uh, on the DRC and so um, keeping high the attention on what is happening in that countries. Uh, the problem is that. Um, when the uh, government or the authorities, the institution lack or they are not present in a proper way on the ground, uh, it's, easy, it's very difficult to go ahead with an agenda. I mean, the government has a lot of issue, a lot of problems. Of course, there is. Uh, um, it's difficult to enforce the law on the ground. There are many, many different reasons because the situation uh, goes like that. Uh, so I really don't know what can be done. Unfortunately, I don't think that in terms of uh, legislation, uh, this will change quite quickly. Yeah. Um, the United Nations peacekeeping mission has been in DRC since 1999, and it is one of the biggest peacekeeping operations in the world with more than 17,000 personals. What are the challenges for such missions and why is it that the rest of the world is still not focusing on what's happening in DRC? Um, well, the why uh, there's no global attention on the DRC is a big question. Uh, I think that um, we tend not to uh, be uh, focused on those crises which are protracted. It's like we are used on that. But there is also, uh, in my opinion, uh, the idea that um, those areas are far from us, far from other countries. And so 
um, not really related to the life we live here, and that's not true at all. Uh, but um, uh, the the presence of the United Nations uh, and many international organizations, it's quite controversial in the area, uh, since the uh, population who also protested very hard for the uh, activities of the um, United Nations of the peacekeeping mission, they have different attitude towards the presence of NGOs. I had a lot of interviews, I had the chance of traveling with the uh, UN peacekeepers, and um, my idea is that the, um, well, I had interview with um, who uh, want more presence of the UN, who want the complete withdrawal of the uh, operations saying that they are uh, part of the problem. Uh, of course, there are some uh, shadows, uh, and of course, there are some inefficiencies. Um, it's also true that the mandate of the peacekeeping is not uh, is a mandate of protecting civilians. It is not easy, and sometimes the population do not clearly understand what's the mandate yeah. of the uh, of the mission is. Uh, so it's not uh, um, it's not just black and white. I mean, it's a, it's very um, multi-sided uh, issue. So even the the presence of the NGOs of the um, United Nations agencies, it's such a lot of. If you interview people around, like maybe displaced people, for instance, they ask and because they need more help. But then maybe you have bad interviews with. Uh, members of the civil society who um, um, challenge the presence of the international community in those areas. It also takes a lot of courage uh, to be a journalist uh, reporting from that area. So on that note, we're running out of time. So my last question to you is, as an independent journalist, what kind of preparation does it take to uh, report from countries like DRC, including from the financial as uh, aspect, because I'm guessing it must be expensive. As you said, you need to have a lot of loose cash, but even overall, what kind of hostile training, what kind of preparation, just any tips for anybody who, who is watching this show and wants to be the next reporter, um, you know, visiting any hostile country or reporting from an hostile environment, what would, you know, what would your advice be for them? Well, the first thing is to, uh, to be trained. Uh, there are a lot of um, a lot. There are some uh, good organizations that train journalists for hostile environment, and um, have been trained from one of these organizations, and uh, uh, and that's absolutely uh, key. Uh, you need to get the advices of journalists who previously travel in that zones. So you need to know how to move. You need to know the the country, and you need to have to. Um, even if it's very difficult to organize everything before, but uh, you need to try to know as well as, as better as possible uh, the country and rely on a journalist that pre previously traveled in that, in that area. Training is absolutely key. Uh, and, um, and also um, having also always someone in the country uh, outside the country ca that can be like a backup and uh, following your uh, your travel uh, and you know, ex explaining and talking every day about the issue you are facing, how to, because things change quite, quite often. But uh, as I said before, this kind of um, reportage cannot be put in place without the help, the solidarity, the support of the community of journalists in the country, in, in my case, in Italy or in, the, in other countries uh, in Europe and uh, in the DRC. So it's a, it's, a, it's a question of having a team and having colleagues you, you trust and hit. In terms of finance and resources, this is a very big challenge because those areas are not such, I mean, high in the agenda of the of the medias and are quite neglected and underreported. I uh, launched a crowdfunding who paid part of the, the cost and the expenses. But, of course, uh, our expenses in terms of uh, 
tools you use and in terms of uh, you know driver the fixture but also costs like you know in the case of drc the accreditation which is quite expensive but it's uh, um it's really it's really a big challenge and everything can change so you need to have yes a lot of cash sometimes uh, you cannot have access to um atm yeah. <laughs> like right, happens to so <laughs> go with a lot of cash and uh and check the security the situations on the road every day every day yeah all right elena thank you so much uh, i'm really happy and uh, thrilled that i kick started my new series on uh, women for press freedom having this amazing conversation with you thank you so much it was truly wonderful to have you on the sanya faruqi show thank you sanya thank you very much for being uh, here all right on that note thank you everyone who's joined us uh, i hope that you will subscribe to our youtube channel and follow us on twitter facebook spotify and also subscribe to our newsletter to keep up with all the updates that you need on what's happening on the sanya faruqi show i'm going to be seeing you again next week